today's discussion, we're talking about how we catalyze investments into nature-based solutions. Um, we're really lucky to have a, a really exciting set of speakers today who I think um, represent sort of important interlinking parts of this ecosystem. Um, so very quickly, I'm Ida, I'm from Galvanize, I'll be moderating this conversation. Um, just for background, Galvanize is we're a climate-focused investment firm, so we invest across venture and growth, real estate and public equities, all with an eye to scaling climate solutions in this decade. I'm joined by Mike Kent, who is co-founder and partner at New Leaf Climate Partners, um, David Sternlicht, who is the head of nature investing at Ethic, and also Kelly Rytel, who is a client success lead at Pachama. And I will um, give them an opportunity to share a little bit more about sort of exactly what they do and where they play um, shortly. Um, but before we get into this, I'm sure, um, you know, I see some familiar faces in the room. I'm sure there are um, investors and practitioners here who are well familiar with what NBS is and don't need the definition, but just a level set for those of you who are coming into the space and, 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 and ramping up, which is what we're excited about. We're, we're, we're trying to, um, I think, we need more people focused on these issues. We need more allocators and investors focused on these issues um, to, to give the 101. So nature-based solutions, and sometimes I will abbreviate as NBS during this conversation, are solutions which help protect, restore, and manage our natural ecosystems. So they are things that can increase the capacity of our ecosystems to um, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, they are things that can enhance ecosystem services like um, water filtration or um, pollination or um, flood regulation. Um, and they are often things that also help conserve um, biodiversity uh, and you know, prevent further degradation of these natural spaces. So in short, sort of nature-based solutions are the levers or the tools that we have to really build our natural capital. Um, so just to make that more concrete, so examples of this could include everything from um, avoiding further deforestation or helping forest restoration, mangroves, peatlands, um, enhancing our ocean health. Um, it's really anything that helps any of those different types of ecosystems. Um, other things that you might hear in this packet might include things like um, green infrastructure or you know things for climate adaptation or um, climate resilient agriculture, regenerative agriculture. Um, and then sort of importantly, uh, I think the other thing that we bucket into nature-based solutions are any of the enabling tools or technologies that help us measure, monitor, and ultimately value the services provided by our ecosystems. So all of that is in the sort of the sphere of, of, of NBS. Um, sometimes I will slip and say natural climate solutions or NCS, which I tend to think of as a subset of N NBS that specifically um, are, are servicing the avoidance or sequestration of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'll just say a few more things on this. So the reason they are important is because they comprise as much, if not more than a third of our total sort of climate impact potential that we have to, to help stay aligned to, to a 1.5 degree scenario. So it's estimated that um, nature-based solutions can uh, uh, remove or avoid as much as 11 to 12 gigatons of emissions per year, um, which is enormous. That's you know, a multiple of what the US emits annually. Um, and they're also among the most cost-effective uh, climate solutions. So um, when we think about what we need to actually achieve 1.5 or, or, or 2 degree scenario, um, obviously there's that you know, requires hundreds of trillions of investment, and nature-based solutions are some of the most effective strategies that we have to actually getting there. Um, although momentum is building, um, nature-based solutions also comprise a really small proportion of climate finance flows today. So you know, I've seen a couple different estimates. Some of them are more sort of worrisome than others. But you know, on, on the low end, folks say that you know, less than 3% of total global climate finance goes into nature-based solutions. It's growing. Um, and there are reasons that it's challenging. And we'll unpack some of the solutions and opportunities to address those today. But um, that's why we're having this conversation. It's a huge impact opportunity and one that we, we don't want to miss. So um, with that, um, I will turn a little bit to our, our, our panelists. So I would love for each of you to tell us a little bit more about your background and the platform you represent and sort of where you play in this, in this space. So I'll start with you, Mike. Great. Thank you, Ida. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's the morning people for nature. Um, I'm Mike Kent. I'm a co-founder and partner of New Leaf Climate Partners. Um, my background is I spent the last decade uh, at BlackRock uh, helping build out their sustainable investing platform um, and was leading a lot of their climate investment activity. Um, in, in 2021, um, took a step back and, and focused uh, on food and agriculture, uh, giving at the Climate Works Foundation, and at the end of 2021, founded uh, New Leaf Climate Partners. I think what's been animating me is sort of asking the question, what's missing with respect to climate finance? And back when I left BlackRock, 
there were very few conversations happening at the institutional investor level around, uh, at, at that point, even food and ag, but nature more broadly. I think we've made uh, sizable uh, progress with respect to food investment, um, but nature is still lagging. So New Leaf Climate Partners, we are a strategic investment and advisory firm focused on mobilizing more capital into NBS. Um, we research, design, build, fund, and deploy new investment strategies targeting bottlenecks in the NBS ecosystem. And we focus, importantly, on what we call blended finance solutions. Um, so the kind of the combination of grant slash philanthropic funding uh, moving to impact investment uh, in order to help hopefully scale toward institutional capital. Um, so a few examples of this, our, our first uh, line of research was actually looking into uh, US seed, uh, uh, as in literal seed and seedling capacity for um, restoration projects, um, and specifically at native varietals. Um, basically, we're, we're underproducing, and we need to, to level up um, in order to meet our planning targets. And so we're launching what we're calling the nursery financing facility to address that gap. Some other concurrent Lines of research include um, helping finance uh, landowners to restore their landscapes and supporting uh, urban greenery projects. So a lot of work, and, um, and we're just getting started. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Over to you, David. Awesome. Morning, everyone. Thank you for, <clears throat> for being here. Um, I'm David Sternlicht. I lead the nature investing platform at Ethic. Ethic's a sustainability-only asset manager. We do uh, custom sustainability focused public equity portfolios and in private markets we invest in projects that regenerate nature and generate some sort of cash flow in the process. Um, we see biodiversity and climate as twin crises, biodiversity loss and climate change as twin crises. Uh, the former is getting a fraction of the attention of the latter, uh, despite the fact that half the global economy is is directly facing some sort of nature risks. It's, it's quite pervasive. Um, by the end of the decade, it's expected that we're going to be in roughly an $800 billion shortfall in terms of financing flowing towards this broad category of nature-based solutions. And, and that's what's required to start bending this curve of nature loss that we're facing. Uh, some of that's going to be bridged by governments, some by philanthropy, and quite a lot by the private sector, which includes corporations and investors. And that's, that's where we come in. Um, we're aiming to do our part in bridging that gap by financing projects that help facilitate this transition uh, to a more regenerative economy. Welcome, David. Kelly. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly Rytel, and I am the client success lead at Pachama. At Pachama, our mission is to protect and restore nature to fight climate change. There's a lot of ways that we could do that, um, but we are focused solely in the forestry space. And right now we have two offerings that are um, that we work with corporates for. And so the first one is we find and vet third-party carbon credit projects. So projects that are already existing, including forest protection credits in the Amazon, in Indonesia, in the tropical forests around the world. Um, and we onboard only about 30% of them after we have conducted our tech-enabled due diligence. Um, we're really pushing the boundaries about what's possible in this industry with our dynamic control area baseline analysis, which is a mouthful. Um, and there's an explainer online if anyone is super curious. But essentially, it provides um, you know, a very high certainty that a ton is a ton. And that is super important for corporates uh, to invest in co with confidence in carbon credits. And the second offering we have is Pachama Originals, where we're standing up new projects, um, mostly in the reforestation space. And this is important um, because we know that there is also need for reforestation. And our suite of technologies can really help scale the market and build a pipeline um, to meet the need and to meet the demand that will come. And it also gives corporate a chance to um, kind of make a real impact and instead of kind of a check the box activity that they feel like this is something that third party bodies are kind of forcing them to do, that this is something that they can craft and um, feel like they are having a, a true impact and able to storytell around that. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Um, so as you can tell, we sort of have a nice mix of, of, of folks sort of tackling um, issues in this space from, from, from different vantage points, and, and we'll hear from, from all of them on, on, on those. Um, so I wanted to start the first part of this conversation talking a little bit about the um, market drivers in the nature-based solutions arena. Um, although nature-based solutions have always existed in some, in some ways, um, uh, I think there's an interesting confluence of factors from the obviously availability of technologies, our understanding of the impact opportunity, um, you know, increased interest from corporates and investors, um, many sort of new regulatory and voluntary initiatives to, to um, you know, further incent activity in this space. And so we wanted to unpack some of those for, to, to, to show some of the momentum in this arena. So I wanted to start with you, Mike, a little bit. Obviously, you helped build New Leaf Climate Partners and, and you've picked you know, a couple different areas um, that you guys are designing products and solutions around. Could you tell us a little bit about um, the you know, convergence of trends that, that caused you to, 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 to build your firm now and also design these you know, particular set of solutions that you're focused on? Sure. I'd say, I think some of the motivating factors, I think, at the macro level are more troubling. I mean, as, as David mentioned, the defining issues of our generation, in my mind, are sort of the climate crisis and biodiversity loss. Um, and <clears throat> fortunately, nature can, can address both in parallel. So I think that pointed us down that path. Um, and then I think on the more optimistic front, so that's kind of why we started looking at nature in the first place. Um, oh, and I should add that there's obviously the massive funding gap that we've been talking about, so this huge risk, and but also this, this large and growing potential. And then I think some of the other trends that are more hopeful are, I think, um, encouraging signs of interest and funding, particularly at the federal and state levels. Um, the passage of the IRA um, historic bill includes funding for everything from um, you know, uh, climate smart agriculture to uh, private forestry improvement and health to urban greenery. Um, and we're seeing, and, and it'll take time to really observe the impacts of that, that funding, um, but I think provides a significant tailwind for us. Um, and then on the corporate side, I think interest in carbon markets evolving, um, obviously some chilling effect from articles, you know, in Bloomberg and Guardian, others that we can discuss. Um, but in general, I think the trend is clear that there's going to be more private sector engagement in nature. Um, and um, one trend that we're seeing that is informing some of our work is sort of a move toward, uh, as you were saying, Kelly, having corporates more involved in the project design. And what, what we've been hearing is sort of an interest in kind of designing and implementing locally uh, or locally relevant projects for corporates. So kind of operating in the communities uh, that, that they practice in and, and have, uh, have impact in. And so um, we're, we're engaging with a number of US-based clients kind of on, on land restoration efforts uh, right here at home. Um, so I think it's really the confluence of factors coming together that's been forming and shaping our strategy. Um, no, that's fantastic. I actually want to dig into every every sort of bit that you that you said there. Um, but maybe just Kelly, I wanted to sort of obviously hear a little bit more about you know Pachama's work as well. You guys focus on both land or forest re your restoration as well as um, you know obviously the avoided uh, avoided degradation. Um, could you talk a little bit about sort of why both sides of that equation are important and, and also how the technology has evolved in the last couple of years um, and what that's enabling? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you mentioned, nature-based solutions have the potential to mitigate 30% of um, emissions by 2030. And so that's a really big chunk. We can't just ignore that. We do know that we need to absolutely drive to zero deforestation by that time. So protecting our current forests is, you know, that needs to be and should be the top priority because you know, a lot of that carbon is what can be considered irrecoverable carbon, which means that if it is cut down, we do not have enough time to restore it um, to the carbon capacity that we we need it to be by, you know, uh, to prevent the worst effects of climate change. So a big chunk of that is, um, is conservation. I think the challenge with that, particularly when it comes to carbon markets, is what, what, we, uh, what we do is we say, you know, if you 
you know, if this project started because of the incentive of carbon credit financing. So now we have to prove a counterfactual that that indeed would have been deforested. And that's the most difficult part, and that's where our technology is um, really focused on in terms of identifying the threats in the region and in a very statistical way proving that, um, that this land and that project is doing a good job at preventing deforestation. And so that's where the advantage advances in satellite monitoring um, and machine learning come in to create these, uh, create these models and make sure we're looking at the threatened areas appropriately. Um, so that's on the, uh, you know, that's why this is hard to do, but it is also why it's so important, um, important to do. And I think I may have missed one element of your question, but I think that should cover most of it. <laughs> no, I think that was a great response. Well, so this is really helpful, and I think so. We talked you know, a tiny little bit about like some of the yeah the, the the what's happening on the supply side, but I also just wanted to help paint a little bit of a picture on on the demand side. And obviously, um, well, without saying the answer, I I would love to hear from one of you on sort of what are you seeing in terms of the demand side evolving, corporate interest in nature based solutions. Obviously, we've seen um, there's been even just in 2023, um, obviously the initial recommendations from the task force for nature focused financial disclosure. I think I got that acronym correct. Um, obviously, there's now um, science-based targets one can set for nature. Um, would one of you want to opine a little bit on what you're seeing in, in trends on the demand side? Sure. David. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you think about the path of climate finance, just that the arc of that story, it was we, we've been aware of climate science for decades. So it's not that there was any uncertainty Apologies if I'm offending anyone on this front. It's not that there was any uncertainty about the risks climate change was posing to society were we not to act. Um, there was a lot of shareholder activism in the early years of ESG and impact investing that moved the needle a bit. There were a ton more asset management firms that were formed to directly finance solutions to climate change. There were um, like groundswells of voluntary corporate pledges to decarbonize in the last few years. And all of this was before there was any meaningful legislation in the US on climate broadly, which in, in the form of the IRA. Um, I see nature, you know, we, we've talked about how nature and, and biodiversity, biodiversity and climate have an ally, a mutual ally in nature. Um, but nature has not gotten as much dedicated attention yet. Um, there have been a lot of seminal research pieces coming out in the last few years. Um, the Paulson Institute did a really great report in 2020. Uh, the World Economic Forum did that report that, that showed 44 trillion of economic activity is dependent on nature. And then people have kind of been, people and firms and other researchers have been deconstructing that and seeing what does that really mean? Well, if pollinators were to be wiped out, $500 billion of crops are at risk. Um, I think it's a third to 40% of all pharmaceuticals in, in circulation have been discovered in nature, not in a laboratory, or maybe with something from nature brought into a laboratory. Um, the list goes on and on. Construction, timber, utilities, telecom, anything that is in nature depends on nature. Um, there are, the last data I saw showed that about 60% of Fortune 500 companies had acknowledged some awareness of nature-related risks, and only 5% had some kind of hard action, some sort of solid pledge um, to reduce those risks and, and potentially capitalize on some opportunities. Um, so I think awareness is growing. Um, it's it's also, yeah, I don't want to get too much into the carbon markets conversation, but it's, it's, it's also... Um, becoming a heck of a lot easier to like measure and attribute the benefits of nature to all, all sorts of Absolutely. issues. I was just going to add, I think <clears throat> the the um, primary route into the nature conversation has been through a climate lens to date, um, and for good reason, as has been discussed. Um, but I think that <clears throat> moving forward, um, there is a separate and evolving and maturing discussion just around nature more holistically. Um, that can follow the playbook of uh, of climate um, and hopefully leapfrog and accelerate a lot of the advances that we've seen in, in climate change sort of investment. Um, so, for example, um, you know, the Climate Action 100, we now have the Nature Action 100, 
focus specifically on engaging with corporates on nature-related risks and opportunities. Um, and you know, the task force for, for nature-related financial disclosure following closely in the footsteps of the TCFD of, of climate-related financial disclosure. Um, and so I think you know, having this um, separate but informed by uh, the climate path, um, I think nature will be able to expand and broaden. Um, but you know, again, this entry point through climate, <clears throat> in some ways, has um, has raised challenges. I think going back to the <clears throat> excuse me, the issue of supply, there was a race toward um, procuring sort of low cost uh, carbon credits, which has put us in this predict kind of this situation we're in today, where ninety seven percent of the market of the voluntary carbon market has focused on. Uh, avoided emissions or reduced emissions as, appo as opposed to emissions reduction or emissions removal. And I think that's because if you only look at it from a climate lens, then you're going to say, how do I basically uh, buy the cheapest carbon credits um, that are most widely available uh, at scale? And at that time, that's been, again, a focus on Red Plus, which we need, but has eliminated or reduced the need or the demand for things like uh, like removal credits. Um, and so again, I think with sort of a, a parallel path of nature related frameworks and investment standards, um, that will set the foundation for increased capital flows, but sort of trailing behind the climate conversation broadly. Yeah, that's, that's such an interesting point. And it's actually, I think a perfect segue to sort of where I wanted to go with this, which is um, as we alluded to nature, does certainly have a climate benefit, but it also has so many other co-benefits, whether those be economic or other forms of environmental um, benefits that they, they can achieve. Um, and, and Kelly, I saw, saw you look up. Um, I would love to maybe turn you, Kelly, a little bit on how you're helping your customers think about that value stack um, above and beyond the, the, the carbon benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to tag on to that last question, I will say that, you know, we've seen kind of two different types of corporates invest in nature. So ones that have like supply chains very close to nature. So they already understand the risks or are further along on that journey. But then we see a lot of leaders, particularly in the tech industry, Netflix, um, Salesforce, Apple that are investing in, um, in nature. And so that's really encouraging. On the biodiversity front, so certainly there is a lot of interest that we're, yeah, that we see with our clients. I think there's, more, yeah, like uh, there's a lot more kind of confusion and a lot less clarity around kind of what they should be aiming for. Um, we have some really cool technology that's coming out that really attempts to put metrics based, um, you know, numbers on biodiversity. And so one of the metrics that we're leaning into and um, socializing with our clients is what is called. Um, uh, technically, it's called the star threat abatement score, and essentially this is meant to be a normalizing factor across all ecosystems to say, if this area is protected, how valuable is it in comparison to other areas? And so um, our, our science team is kind of knee deep and wading through all these um, numbers and figures to uh, figure out how to convey this information and, and convey how important it is to protect these ecosystems so that our corporate partners can uh, can also tell that story and, and the importance of kind of how much um, biodiversity and threatened species are in that area that are uh, will directly benefit from uh, for, from protection or restoration well that I have to ask um, obviously we have carbon markets we are seeing sort of nascent emergence of biodiversity markets which I think is very exciting um, does anyone want to take the over under on whether what what does our biodiversity market look like in in five years time does it exist I hope so <laughs> yeah I think the challenge now is <clears throat> As Kelly was explaining, just around measurement um, frameworks, standards, a ton of carbon is a ton of carbon. What's biodiversity? It's all place-based and context-specific. Um, so having a tradable instrument, I think, is um, is the challenge, uh, not insurmountable. But I think that's um, where the market, from my perspective, where the market's at now. But um, hopefully we move past this point to where it can be a complement to the existing carbon markets. But again, it captures all these other co-benefits that we care about and we know that we need to address. Interesting. Um, yeah. <clears throat> no, I, I think they absolutely have a role too. They just need to, biodiversity credits need to be careful not to be perceived or positioned as offsets because 
the notion of like destroying a healthy ecosystem over here and planting a few trees over here and washing your hands of it doesn't really work. It's not fungible like carbon, um, which poses a challenge in developing a market around something that's inherently very difficult to commodify and standardize across different ecosystems um, and geographies, but folks are trying. So I don't expect there to be significant portions of the volume as in carbon markets rolling through one or two registries. I think there's going to be a lot of different methodologies and and companies with different levels of awareness and targets around nature can pick something around a specific species or specific type of ecosystem that might help de-risk their supply chain. Um, it's going to be a little bit wild westy for most of these next five years, I think. But come year five, I hope the dust has settled into something that works. No, fair, fair enough. I think that it, that's... Not, that is as realistic a pathway as I think anyone could could imagine. Um, so, before we sort of turn to the to the next part of our conversation, I really want to focus on 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 sort of the capital availability and trends we're seeing and in, 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 in investment in the space. Um, I did want to just want to say in, in climate, we talk so much about the IRA, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, and um, the bi uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, you know, being such tailwinds for our space. And there are pockets of these that are really targeting nature-based solutions, in particular climate smart commodities, all these different pieces. I'm, I'm curious, and, and I know David and Mike, you both alluded to, to their influence in your work. Are you seeing the this legislation help drive up, whether it's sort of capital deployment or or um, solution scale up in, in the arenas you're working in, um, and and the answer could also be that you know there are, are still challenges in taking advantage of them. But I'd, I'd be curious if you've seen it as a tailwind so far. Happy to start. I mean, certainly yes, but I think it's still too early to really feel the effects of the funding. Um, but um, I think has has encouraged and incentivized a lot of folks to be thinking about the sector in more concrete ways. Um, and for us, what that has meant has been looking at the legislation to say, you know, for um, for the landowner sort of support pieces included in the IRA for, for forest landowners, for private forest landowners, for the urban forestry um, component of the IRA, what's missing from these bills? Um, and what does it not address? Um, I think it's uh, unrealistic um, and unhelpful for us to put all of our emphasis only on a single piece of legislation and think that we've solved the problem. Of course, this is just one single funding cycle, obviously a, a step in the right direction, but it leaves open the need for um, for leverage finance, for, for kind of piling on private finance. Um, and so, you know, for the landowner piece, I mean, there are a lot of restrictions for what they can and can't do, and so we're trying to think, you know, where are the gaps with that? For urban forestry, for example, you know, the IRA doesn't fund maintenance of trees. And this is a long-term issue and a significant issue when we're thinking about urban canopy, for example. And so how might a private sector uh, player or partner come kind of fill that fill that gap? And so I think that's where um, it's been supportive in, in moving the conversation forward. And it's, again, it's a step in the right direction, but it also, you know, leaves the potential and need for others to kind of crowd in around it. Fair enough. Um, Fantastic. Well, so I wanted to spend the second half of this conversation talking a bit more about um, trends in investing in nature-based solutions and what some of the you know ongoing barriers still are that I think each of our, our, our panelists are, are are helping work addressing. But I wanted to start obviously with start, start with you, David, to to talk a little bit about obviously you're building this platform at Ethic, which I presume is also in response to increased demand for nature positive investments. And so, could you share a little bit about what you're seeing from your your clients and the allocators you work with on um, on on demand for these strategies? Sure. Yeah. So, so I mentioned, you know, biodiversity went from being a very marginalized and minimally understood issue to um, one that's gotten quite a lot of press attention and attention in sustainability circles initially in Europe and now increasingly in the U.S. And and yeah, our our client base is mostly U.S. investors, and we've seen quite a lot more interest in this broad topic of of nature and biodiversity in in public markets and also in private markets. And I think part of it is that nature is just a little bit more of a unifying force um, and not as politically polarized versus climate. And I think that's what's going to allow attention and capital flowing towards nature to accelerate much more quickly than the 15, 20 year arc of, of climate finance. Um, but in terms of the opportunity set that, that allocators see, that our investors might see, 
most of the funds and asset managers investing in nature-based solutions have been formed in the last three years or so. Um, so I think one impediment to things ramping up more quickly is just that as an allocator is evaluating the space, it's legitimized by a perceived breadth of potential investment opportunities and then depth of the market they're under, like depth in terms of, well, how much can any given asset manager bring into their pipeline and, and potentially finance? And so um, I think that's one hurdle. I've been to a lot of panels on nature-based solutions. Uh, I've never heard the category defined as clearly as you did at the outset here. And I think a lack of that really helps people wrap their mind around what this category means. Some people describe NBS and what they're really just talking about is um, avoided deforestation projects that are monetizing via carbon credits. So that's kind of one type of project and one revenue model. And that's not enough dimensionality for an allocator to say, okay, this is, this is an interesting enough category that I could carve out a slice of my asset allocation for it. But if it's described as a broad range of project types, cutting across different ecosystems, um, using very tried and true, not, none of these projects is easy to execute. Planting trees isn't easy. Um, doing regenerative agriculture is tried and true. And it's there's no technology risk. It's not necessarily easy. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that if you do it well, you can. If you execute well, you can do it. Um, and so I think once folks appreciate this isn't rocket science, this is sort of a, a unified investment theme in that ecosystem services are an undervalued asset to humanity, and we're going to wrap our minds around <laughs> properly valuing nature and all that it provides to us. Um, then I think that paired with better communication about what this family of opportunities looks like, um, that's what can help bring more investors off the sideline, I think. So, so we're getting there. The depth in the market, the breadth is improving. Well, well, David, you're teeing yourself up. You've done some interesting thinking, I think, on this idea of, of nature as an asset class. And um, maybe just to stay with you for, for a beat, could, I, I think you started alluding to, to, to that. But, but uh, I would love to hear your case for, for why, it, why it is and how that helps investors and allocators um, think about you know, deploying toward this opportunity set. Mike's going to fight me on this, I think. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think it is and it has to be. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I teed, up, I teed up how I feel about this and what I, and what I was just sharing. But um, the thing about asset classes from an investor's point of view is there's not a unified definition. Um, I, I wrote down how the Yale Investment Office, which is you know the preeminent endowment style institution, um, institutional investment office, uh, thinks the definition is. The definition of an asset class is quite subjective, requiring precise distinctions where none exist. And this is the most sophisticated institutional investor out there. <laughs> um, and I'm not knocking Yale. I'm, I'm acknowledging that, like, even even they say it's it's a little bit hazy. So, um, you know, what what are some analogies we could look at? The, the, the cryptocurrency space. There's not a whole lot that's consistent across different types of token, other than the word token and the words crypto. Um, but they were remarkably successful over the last really five years in kind of positioning the cryptocurrency world as an asset class, despite limited consistency. Um, real estate is another one. So there's an, an investor like Yale investing in real estate could do anything from supporting three folks who are buying up property in Idaho and developing, I don't know, what do you develop in Idaho? Um, de 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 develop big potato farms, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, develop big communities of single family houses, perhaps. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, you could have um, industrial or logistical space by an airport. And all of that's technically real estate. Hotels are real estate. Office space is real estate. Um, so there's quite a lot of variety within that theme. Um, but it's nonetheless perceived as an asset class. Um, and yeah, I, I think it can be anything that provides exposure to this unique set of market forces. And if if calling nature an asset class is what equips allocators with the right mental model with which to approach this space and say, this deserves concerted effort and attention and X percent of my asset allocation, maybe 80 or 90. Um, 
maybe more realistically, like one to two, um, <laughs> then then we're moving. All, all, yeah. all right. Con consider me convinced. It has a, a, a shared set of risk return attributes, and and uh, and and otherwise, you know, it's cross asset class, and it's otherwise hard to characterize them. Does anyone want to <laughs> respond to that? I'll provide a counter, which is, I think that nature presents risks and opportunities across asset classes and cannot be constrained into one particular, as has been discussed, the, there's so much variety in, in how you can talk and think about nature-based investments. Um, I think we should encourage institutional investors to think about nature across their total portfolios and sort of take a more of an integration approach, which doesn't preclude having carve outs to say this is our nature bucket, 2% of assets, whatever. But I think we should go farther to say, Within public equities, what are, what are my what are my exposures to nature risk within my portfolio, and how are we managing that? I think it's a similar, very similar playbook, which we advocated for while I was at BlackRock, which is to say, take a total portfolio view of climate risk. What are you doing about it? How are you setting targets and standards against each asset class? And in a way, that's sort of a, um, in my mind at least, a more direct theory of change because you're you're working within the existing mental models of the portfolio manager that sits on the real estate desk. But now you're saying, hey, in addition to these risks, you, you look at these numbers all day, here's another set of data that you should be considering when making your, when factoring your investment decisions. So this is sort of incrementally moving the needle, but it's moving the needle against hundreds of trillions instead of you know a, a, just a small portion of that. Um, so maybe, maybe it's a, a yes and, maybe it's not as <laughs> confrontational as I thought. <laughs> Well, I'll jump in and provide kind of perspective on then the supply side, the supply side being the people who are on the ground protecting nature, um, restoring it. And so I think that f in order for a lot of capital to move, there has to be this kind of trust and transparency and like, oh, this is how much, you know, nature is going to be restored. Here are the hectares. Here's what the trees are going to look like. So all of that stuff is very, very manual right now. Like, again, we're coming from the lens of um, carbon inventory. So there's, you know, the way we measure carbon in trees is still the same way we measure it decades ago, which is people out in the field with tape measures, you know, measuring different trees, throwing a stone, measuring the trees in that like diameter. And so this is all super manual. And now with advances, again, in kind of the satellite technology, machine learning, like we're able to um, use different uh, data sets. So radar, LIDAR, um, in order to more accurately estimate the carbon on the ground without having to go there. And so there's always going to be a role of, of people on the ground uh, making sure that these uh, projects are successful. But there is also an element of automating what can be automated. Um, and particularly for the carbon markets, this also means like taking the people what they do best, which is planting and planting trees and making sure they survive um, and helping them with the documentation to prove like, hey, this is how much carbon we've restored. So I think there's a lot of work too that you know we're beginning to do um, to make sure that these are, there is a very clear risk reward um, that that we that you know everyone can articulate to to the institutional investors. Um, no, Kelly, I think that's a great point, um, and exactly sort of where I want to go next because I think there's uh, just just to sort of wrap up this this bit. I think there's this this challenge of both needing a little bit of, of a, a center, both a center of excellence on nature within an investment management context, and also a, a shared. Um, uh, you need something around which to. Um, orient everyone's sort of like collective efforts. At the same time, you need to embed that expertise and knowledge throughout your asset classes and throughout your team. So I think yes and is probably a little bit the the uh, where I'm landing, net net. Um, but, but <laughs> I didn't disagree with Mike. <laughs> um, but, but Kelly, just to build off what you just said, I think, you, you know, we've talked a bit about many of the the, the drivers of momentum here, but, but at the same time, it is challenging, right? There is the... Um, there, there's many aspects. Obviously, it's an emerging solution set. So a lot of the things that are being scaled are are, are relatively like new businesses and solutions. Um, oftentimes, they're in emerging markets, which are difficult to operate in. Um, they're they're cross asset class. Um, they and then there's also this sort of reputational risk associated with some of the um, you know, ongoing 
our evolving ability to to assess carbon stock, right? And so, so I think that's exactly what you're getting at, which is like technology is enabling us to to ensure the quality here, which is how we address some of that sort of ongoing concern, which I think has been one of the things that's made investors sometimes more 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 more, more dodgy. But um, um, I think we're. Can I ahead, just yeah. respond to that really quick? I, so I think um, in my mind, it calls for a need for increased transparency and accounting. Uh, rules and standards for corporates with respect to carbon markets. Um, to date, it's been sort of everything is treated as equal. Uh, but I think there's an evolving, there's some momentum around sort of having separate carbon ledgers for different types of carbon projects. So distinguishing between an avoided deforestation project with, um, you know, uh, afforestation or reforestation project, for example. Um, and so if we can kind of fix the carbon accounting um, from a corporate perspective, that may lend itself to increased uh, investment and in capital flows in some of the projects we know we need to um, invest in and, and, and bolster. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so you talked a bit about sort of the, the quality piece here. Um, we'd love also just to hear, I think sort of one, one, one thing I sometimes hear is like, there is a you know, emerging supply of capital that wants to invest in quality projects, but is there enough supply. Um, so maybe David and Kelly, I'll turn to you to talk a little bit more about sort of the efforts you guys are taking to engender that that quality supply. Yeah, so so definitely, you know, we know that there's not enough high quality supplies certainly to meet the net zero targets that are coming the voluntary net zero carbon uh, voluntary net zero uh, goals that corporates have uh, have <laughs> adhered to. I would say that you know, carbon markets, of course, are in the name is optimizing for carbon. And so particularly for uh, reforestation projects, we see that that is really what it's optimized for. So we have, you know, plantations of invasive species that we know harm local biodiversity. And so from, you know, what we saw in looking at these so-called removals projects is that not, you know, very few of them are optimized for nature. And so for that, you know, we, we, our criteria includes a certain number of native species, a certain percent of native species, and making sure that they're regionally appropriate um, for, that, uh, for that particular area that they're in. And so there really wasn't enough uh, supply that we, um, that we thought was gonna be needed for the, for the demand, and, and which is why we started um, Bachama Originals. Um, and we have a really great um, partner uh, with um, Mercado Libre, who's the largest tech company in Latin America. And so we have um, we've been very lucky to partner with them and expand um, across Latin America for for these types of projects. And um, so that's really the kind of um, the beginning of of what Pachama Originals is. And uh, and will you know scale to to meet that uh, to meet that supply? But there's still a lot of a lot of work to be done. Um, maybe I'll pass it over to David for the rest. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I'm I'm a fan of the Pachama Originals product, so if you can't endorse yourself, I can. Um, uh, you know, we've in the course of looking at projects that cut across this category of uh, cut across categories: agriculture, agroforestry, so integrating timber and agriculture. Re ecosystem restoration and other forms of reforestation. Um, we're, of course, kind of widening our funnel of potential opportunities. So the, the broader you look, the more you see. Um, specifically in the space in which Pachama operates, there are a ton of grassroots NGOs um, that have a few decades of experience planting trees and restoring nature in a specific area. There are indigenous groups that have thousands of years of applying traditional ecological knowledge to stewarding their landscapes around them. Um, and what they might lack is the knowledge or capacity to convert what they're already doing into a bankable project. So they might be just kind of relying on grants from the Nature Conservancy or Conservation International every year when they could be um, leveraging the markets and selling credits to corporations um, by just continuing to do what they're already doing and applying um, some digital MRV and knowledge on project development documentation. Um, and so I think it's, it's critical that, that groups like Pachama are, are helping these grassroots um, NGOs bring more supply onto the market. No, absolutely. Um, just on that note, David, uh, and I welcome any of you responding to this. Uh, here's what you guys are seeing in terms of 
innovations or market initiatives to enhance bankability and long-term offtakes for a lot of these projects that are being developed. I think, so the corporates that I've been connecting with and speaking with, I, that's sort of where they're at. A lot of them are purchasing in the spot market um, and, and transacting for carbon credits that have already been issued. I think what Petrama is doing is trying to, in a sense, pre-finance some of the project work and, and initiate more projects. But many corporates are hesitant to do that, A, because we're in a changing sort of regulatory environment and there's increasing scrutiny around corporate carbon purchases, which has had a chilling effect in general. And so and in a time when we need corporates to be looking in the future to say, OK, I'll, I'll pre-finance or I'll pre-purchase carbon credits for this project going out to 2030 to meet my goals, um, a lot of folks are scaling back. Um, and so um, yeah, I think that's definitely where we need to go. But there, but there are some serious headwinds that we're, that we're facing. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think in some cases, it's a corporation signing a long-term credit purchase agreement. And this is really taking a page out of Renewable Energy's book. So the, the solar and wind power purchase agreement was a huge factor in, in spurring enormous amounts of capital flowing into that space in the last decade, because what it effectively did was if you had a utility with a AAA credit rating um, signing an agreement to purchase 25 years worth of electrons from you at an agreed upon price, um, then me as someone coming in and financing a project up front only has to evaluate, can you stay on budget and, and on time? How quickly can you interconnect this project to the grid? Because that's what's going to affect my return. Um, same principles apply here. I think, sure, corporations can use their balance sheets to pre-finance some projects, but third-party capital is much more much more interested in coming in. A project becomes much more bankable if they're instead using their procurement budget or some sort of long-term purchasing. And I think this also this applies in, in carbon, and there are a handful of mostly tech companies, some forward-thinking companies that are signing longer-term carbon credit purchase agreements. Um, it's happening a little bit less in food and agriculture, but whenever I get the chance to engage with a big food or commodities company, and they're talking about regenerative agriculture and wondering what they can do, to me, that's all procurement. Like, if you're willing to help a wheat farmer transition to regenerative and maybe buy wheat and some sort of legumes or other cover crop that they have to use as a, as a result of adopting regenerative practices. Um, and if you can sign an agreement to purchase that over a long period of time, then you're de-risking it for the farmer, for the investor. Um, so I think there's some kind of slight behavioral changes uh, that can go a long way in making these things more bankable for us. Yeah, I agree with everything um, that's been said. I think there was a, a long pause after your question because this is that is the biggest question, right? <laughs> like, we need finance, and, and how does it work in the ecosystem? So absolutely, the um, power purchase agreements um, that were signed by first utilities and still utilities, but also corporates, is um, is really huge. And so definitely taking a page um, from, from that playbook, and that's certainly the model that our corporates have been um, most interested in, although there are definitely corporates who are willing to um, to invest capital but I think in order to get the middle of the market like we're, we have to have the um, the the long-term offtake agreements in order to kind of move capital at scale um, fair enough and, and very succinct answers to absolutely what is the the big systems problem um well so we have just a couple minutes left um, and so I have sort of one more um, substantive question for our, our panelists and I'll, I'll encourage everyone to start mulling on um, questions. We'll have the opportunity to do audience Q&A after this for a couple of minutes. So, so start stewing on your questions. Um, obviously we, you know, our audience here represents a, a wide mix of, 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 of players, NBS or otherwise um, throughout the sort of uh, in investment um, ecosystem. And so the question I wanted to end on was um, what should, in, how should investors think about their pathways towards investing in, in nature-based solutions over time? And what is the role of different types of investors and in capital in catalyzing this space? So another big question. And Mike, I've known you've done some thinking on this. So I'm gonna call on you first. Yeah, no, it's a great question um, and something I think about often. I think it, in my mind, at least, in, in this room, it starts with strategic philanthropy. Um, well, you know, the smallest market, but potentially potential for highest outsized impact from a social environmental perspective. Um, 
you know, the Climate Works Foundation, where I used to sit, puts out an annual study of global philanthropic giving, I think something like 780 billion last year, less than 2% of that went to climate mitigation, and an even smaller fraction of that, so something like 0.0, .0 2% of, of the global total went to nature. Um, and so I think for philanthropy, it should be a sign that we need to increase giving in terms of research, in terms of selfishly, in terms of investment fund develop and concept research, um, and with an eye towards scaling financial solutions in the sector. So I think that's, that's where I would start. And of course, there's some great work already happening with respect to standards and frameworks development, um, but I think there's more that we, that we have to do. Um, then I think sort of moving up, once we have philanthropic investment that can get research ideas to sort of an investable concept, that's where impact investors come in who can provide concessionary capital to prove out concepts at, at a bigger scale. Um, obviously, a slightly bigger market here, more than a trillion in assets, maybe 1.3 or so, according to the gen. And as we saw yesterday in the opening session, similar percentages going to nature right now. So I think it's just upping the level of investment from this category. Again, folks that are willing to take innovative approaches to catalyzing uh, investment solutions, whether it's you know um, through de-risking, guarantees, um, cap returns. These are all things we need in order to eventually get to the big pots of money, which is the institutional uh, markets, hundreds of trillions of dollars available here. Um, and I think for the institutional investors in the room, I, I would say what needs to happen now is more of a, an intense focus on um, standards and framework development with respect to incorporating nature as an investment risk. It's not sort of an side impact thing or a CSR thing. This should be central to the investment community's thinking in terms of how should we approach our asset allocation and then within asset allocation approach our individual security selection or projects we develop. Um, we're still a ways off, but by the time we've developed standards in institutional markets, I think hopefully, fingers crossed, we've have, we will have gone a cycle through this kind of pipeline from philanthropy to impact to, to scaled approaches. Um, so that's my, that's my wishful thinking. There you have it. <laughs> well, fantastic. Well, I love to end these with a little bit of a lightning round um, to keep it light before we move to audience Q&A. So I'm going to ask you each a couple of questions. And you have to respond not in one word, but really just one sentence with a period at the end of it. Um, so um, I'm going to start with you, Kelly. What is your favorite nature-based solution? Well, this one's obvious, um, but for me, it's the Amazon, uh, investing in the Amazon. I became an environmentalist in sixth grade when I found out they were cutting down the Amazon, and you know, fast forward, it's still happening today, so certainly anything that protects the Amazon is where, where my heart lies. David? Anything on a degraded landscape, because if we can show the ability to rejuvenate the damage that we've done, then we can give people hope at a time that they need it. Is that a sentence? That was maybe multiple. Yeah, yeah. Some, some, some semicolons in there. there yeah. Some becauses and ands and yeah. Mike. Um, well, today we're in San Francisco, so I'm gonna say street trees. Um, it's not the largest mitigation lever we have, but I think it comes with so many co-benefits mm -hmm. that are important, um, protecting against urban heat island, and then of course there are important environmental justice implications of them, and I just love uh, identifying trees around the city. So it's true. Your Babana Gardens in Salesforce Park, case in point. Um, well, thank you to our panelists for this excellent discussion. I hope you guys all um, learned a thing or two. Um, with that, we actually now have 10 minutes for audience questions. So um, if anyone has a question, we'd be glad to take it over there. Uh, thank you for the insightful panel. Uh, my name is Jasmeet Singh, and I am representing Pay Climate Fund. We are a carbon project developer. Having a portfolio of agroforestry projects invested one million to build a pipeline. And as the topic is catalyzing investment in NBS to mainstream, we are looking forward for 50 million pre-financing. We heard the example of uh, Netflix, Apple, Salesforce, that who are going forward for the off-take commitments, and also have examples of Nestle and Shell who are giving up. So corporates will run with their own desires with the off-take and bankability. So what type of uh, financing available in the mainstream for pre-financing these kind of scales. In next five to 10 years, everybody find a fairy tale that all needs the financing. But at this stage, 
if the communities on the parent line in the global south need financing, what type of asset managers are coming on forward or it's considering agroforestry, first five years no revenue and it's a 30 years period. So what type of mainstream financing available to fund these kind of projects on the ground? Thank you. So I'll, I'll repeat the question um, for the recording. So the, the question was, what type of financing is available for agroforestry, other nature-based solutions, projects? What's that? For the project, no revenue for first five years, and then it start kicking in. So we see private equity, they would not like to pick up these kind of investments. So what yep. kind of financing and corporates are not giving the okay to Sure. So th this was another thing I didn't mention in the importance of calling nature an asset class, positioning nature as a distinct asset class is because if we try to fit projects like this into the lens through which a typical private equity investor sees the world, they're going to want to see a 25% IRR, which nature can often not deliver if you're splitting the pie appropriately to investors, indigenous groups, developers, et cetera. Um, and they're going to want to see liquidity in five to seven years. And you're talking about cash flows beginning in year five, which is more of a typical you know, greenfield restoration project or, or project development. So there needs to be patient forms of capital. And there are several, like there, there are, if to d more directly answer your question, there have been, again, a handful of funds formed in the last three years or so, most of which have a 15 plus year time horizon as a nod to the fact that these projects take a while to literally germinate. And Having a cutoff, though, is also a nod to the fact that if this is to become an asset class that that a Yale endowment office would eventually invest in, there does need to be a chain of liquidity and an ability for those who finance the project for the first 10 years to pass it on to someone who wants to own it for the next 18 to 20. Um, and so that's something we're studying closely and planning for at the time that we're coming into projects. and most of our peers are doing the same. So I would say there's still there's still not enough capital, clearly. Otherwise you would you would have an easier job, I would imagine. But um, I would say one response uh, to your question is it's not mainstream that <laughs> particular type of capital you seek. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And if anyone else wants to add to that. Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, there is the capital and then us, you know, Pachama as in, in some ways the intermediary, like can specialize then in providing that data and information that that gets um, the patient capital uh, more comfortable. But I think it is true that there also needs to be, you know, people who understand and believe in these markets, right? Um, I always kind of think about these investments of like left brain and right brain. So certainly let's get the numbers, let's understand what the risks are, all of that stuff that's necessary. But at the end of the day, we're all humans, and particularly as the impacts of climate change um, continue to, the physical impacts of climate change continue to intensify, I think there's also a need for people to feel like they're contributing, to want to leave a legacy. So I think that there is a lot of, you know, like, yeah, storytelling and, and speaking to the different part of the brain that I think is essential as well. Good response. Um, I think I saw your hand first. Uh, yeah, you. Um, kind of under the spirit of urban canopy and urban co benefits, are you guys aware of any investment opportunities or firms that are specifically focusing on greening public schools and those spaces? Because they're really more like prison. <laughs> 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 um, actually, yes, we are. Uh, or <laughs> we're looking into this. Um, so California, through CAL FIRE, has just initiated a large um, funding program focused on yeah, greening schoolyard um, initiative. Um, I think the primary thrust is obviously going to be through public spending. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I think one of the gaps in this program is funding of maintenance. And so something that we're examining is, is there a role for city for urban carbon credits to play in basically financing the, the ongoing costs uh, of associated with tree maintenance, which can be sort of um, on a similar timeline as uh, the credit cycle, essentially. Um, and so that's a, that's a kind of a research concept that's um, uh, in development now. Um, I'm not, oh, I've been doing some digging for the past uh, nine months now. I haven't come across any other fund managers looking at this. Um, 
but I think more should. Um, because I think, to your point, it's, there's such great need, and um, it's not a mitigation solution, but there's so many other benefits that come with this that we need to promote, so. I'll also mention, so one of the um, carbon credit projects that we currently partner with is called King County, um, King County Rural, uh, Rural something and uh, so that so the King County is from is where Seattle is based in Washington and they also have an urban an urban counterpart for that's getting funding through carbon markets so you um, you should check out that program so it's King County like urban uh, urban forestry initiative fantastic sir over there. Can you maybe talk a little bit more uh, about the role of the public sector? And maybe I love the magic wand question, right? If you could wave a magic wand and do one thing that either the federal or state government could do to move this along, what would it be? So, yeah, we talked a bit about the historic investment through the IRA and at the state level, especially in California. And I think magic wand, I mean, Step one would be to stop subsidizing nature harmful activity, um, which is to the tunes of hundreds of billions every year. Um, step two, you know, wishful thinking wand. Um, step two would be um, actually incentivize uh, nature positive investment. Um, uh, and you know, three would be we if we could develop uh, standards in terms of uh, accounting for carbon and nature simultaneously to encourage more cap, um, corporate investment into the sector. Um, so these are all big ifs, but, um, but that's, where, that's where I'd start. If I had a magic wand, I think I'd make this Larry Fink's top priority. Because <clears throat> if the biggest shareholders in the world are telling the companies for whom they are the biggest position on their cap table um, that they need to start incorporating this, then the needle will move faster. So go back to where I came from this week. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we have two magic wands, right? Uh, do we have time for another question or two? Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, up front. Are they in, intended to shift behaviors or maintain the status quo by just saying, hey, I invested in this, but I can just keep doing what I'm doing and it's contributing to all the problems in the first place? So that's just a question. Is that the intent to, to shift behaviors? Um, it's not a basic question. I think it's pretty complicated. Um, so I guess the way that I would think about that is, um, in short, no, we're not just trying to play into the status quo necessarily. And I think going back to the role of philanthropy and catalytic capital, there's, in my mind, the opportunity to set the foundation for a new standard and the way we think about monetizing these activities that doesn't fit into an existing sort of playbook or capitalist playbook. Um, but over time, once those standards are set, which incorporates the values that we've been talking about, indigenous and local community involvement, you know, appropriate payment and compensation for landowners, things like that, and the model is developed and refined and scaled, then, then yeah, in a sense, you do want it to be sort of a playbook that you can repeat and, and um, standardize, because that's how you're going to generate more transactions and cash flow into the sector. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so I don't approach this as sort of Here's a way to make money as you're as you're used to doing and thinking about investments. We're, I'm still sort of over here saying, what's a new system that we can help create that has a sort of financial return and a new sort of risk profile? Um, but I think we're still collectively figuring out the the details of that system at a project level and at a systems level. Um, so yeah, I, hope, I don't know if that answered your question directly, but that's some immediate thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, what a lot of this is doing is helping nature participate in the current economic system, which is not a long-term fix. Because unless, you know, we're changing, you can tap into people's minds by showing them a financial model that shows a project that 
restores an ecosystem, generates a reasonable risk-adjusted return over a 30-year period, but it still doesn't solve the problem that we don't see, we don't yet see nature degradation as an absolute last resort, avoid at all costs, we're not going to do any more of this. Um, and so if this category of investments, if this whole nature-based solution space isn't also changing hearts and behaviors, then it's a failure. So I think it's, it's a critical ingredient. It was a great question. Maybe just tagging on one more response to your question. I, I do think that, you know, for instance, in Galvanize, we do have a public equity strategy where we're engaging with our management teams to, to help them both operate more sustainably as well as shift finance towards climate solutions. And a pillar of that is, in fact, changing their existing behavior. I think, you know, one thing that I, organizations like Ceres, for instance, have done great work on is, you know, deforestation-free supply chains, right? And so, so I do think there is a, a role in like a public equities context for engagement on shifting current behavior as, as one answer to your question too. Uh, great. Oh, uh, I'm gonna go with you. It's on this time. Thank you, make my life easy. Um, so I'm a little discouraged to hear today that corporates are kind of pulling back away from action that's gonna lead to sequestration in the future and, and nature-based solutions in the future um, in favor of certainty and products that have that certification. Um, because I get the reporting standards are there to hold them accountable, but them kind of pulling back from the solution-oriented approach is kind of counterintuitive. So I guess my question is, how is the conversation going to evolve in the future so that corporations are mixing the bag. They've got the certainty that they can be held accountable to, but they're also doing the more that we need to actually solve the problem. Um, I can jump in just to kind of repeat my understanding. So discourage that kind of corporates are pulling back, you know, and what, you know, how can we kind of shift the tide potentially? So it's a, you know, again, from the perspective of carbon markets, I mean, carbon markets has long been fairly volatile. And so I think this year with the negative, um, you know, a couple of uh, negative press articles that there's been a bit of kind of like regrouping, kind of trying to understand a little bit. Um, we really like uh, SBTI's um, quote, and that's the science-based target initiative about no regress investment. You know, the time to invest is now, and um, you know we are working with the best information that we have at the time. And so, there are corporates that are, you know, they're taking measured approach. They want to make sure that they're making the right decision um, to avoid negative uh, negative press. Um, but my hope is that the the, the media tide will shift and um, start highlighting some of the really positive work that that is happening, um, you know, with corporates. But really on the ground, I think a lot of the media articles, like, unfortunately, don't talk about the people on the ground doing the hard work. I mean, for decades, particularly for carbon markets, I mean, people were standing up projects without any guarantee of any revenue. Um, and so that it's it's just, it's really discounting the work and the impact that it's having on the community. So I would really love to, you know, see more coverage on uh, from that angle. But I'm sure there's a lot of ways to answer that question, so. All right, I mean, just to build on that, the a lot of the press undermined confidence in two of the biggest and most important players in carbon markets. So the biggest nonprofit registry and the biggest developer of carbon credits. And it's an immature, very consolidated market at this point. So when folks are looking cynically at those two, it's it's easy to understand why things have to slow down a little bit. Um, but there's a lot of nuance in the way that market actors are really interpreting the news. And I think there's been there's been a deprioritization of 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 the avoided loss type of credits that Mike mentioned have represented 97% of historical activity in carbon markets and an increasing priority of credits that are directly represent the direct removal of carbon through the planting and growing of trees, um, which have represented a fraction of 3%, I guess. The um, you know native species reforestation has been a fraction of 3%. And so the, the true the credits that represent true solutions for nature in terms of biodiversity and carbon and soil and water are still commanding a significant premium in the market. So it's it's not it's not going away, um, but it is discouraging. It's it's of course a little discouraging. I think it's just a bit of a storm that'll pass though. 
Yeah, I'll try to end on an optimistic note, which is, um, seems like they're, the dust will settle on the most recent controversy, but hopefully it'll point the market toward quality and sort of these long-term sort of removal projects. Um, and you know, um, we've seen some activity just here in California recently. Newsom signed a bill um, with respect to the voluntary carbon markets and increasing disclosure uh, and reporting against those. And so I think that's you know one small step, but I think as accountability from a corporate perspective and then the kind of frameworks that we use to govern sort of the voluntary carbon markets evolve and mature, um, that will point us to quality, give more investors and corporates confidence to make those long-term investments. Um, but two, I think it's also um, hopefully a wake-up call for other types of investors, again, like we've been saying, impact investors or, or philanthropies to step in to provide catalytic capital in a market that's been drying up that we know that we need to promote and prop up.